Hey, good morning, everyone. Good morning to those of you watching at our Lockport campus and our Cheektowaga campus, and thanks if you joined us online today. If you have a Bible with you, get to Ephesians chapter four, or if you use your cell phone, get there to Ephesians chapter four. While you're doing that at all of our campuses, I want you to look at the person next to you and say, you look awesome today. Just do that, can we? We want to make sure you hear that at least once this week. And uh, just in case, you know, Valentine's Day this weekend, we want to make sure you hear it this week at least once, okay? So we're glad that you've joined us today. Um, I want to begin by telling you a story that is a true story. It may seem like a fable when I start to tell you, but it's a true story of a hockey team that was once very, very good. And for our purposes today, we'll just call them the Buffalo Sabres just for our purposes. The year was 2007, and this team was uh, on the fast track to the Stanley Cup playoffs and seemed like maybe this was our year, which is the delusion that every Western New York sports fan believes every year. This is our year, right? And so it was 2007, I was uh, living in central Virginia at the time and following the progress of of the Sabres from there, Uh, doing the best I could to, you know, find the games online, go to Buffalo Wild Wings, where I was living, in the town I was living, and uh, ask them to put on the Buffalo Sabres on the screen, and they said, the the what? You know, um, and uh, so I asked them to put that game on, and following the progress, and a few of my friends who were from this area, and actually from this church, were living there as well, and we saw on the schedule that the Sabres would be playing a game in Raleigh, North Carolina, because when you think of North Carolina, you think of hockey, right? (laughs) And so uh, it was about two hours drive, so we decided to go down. It was going to be the Sabres uh, playing against the Carolina Hurricanes. And, And it came to pass in those days that the Sabres decisively won the game. Now again, I know that that may seem hard to imagine but they actually did it, okay? So they decisively win the game. And me and my friends, it was about uh, three or four of us, and uh, we're all from Western New York, all wearing, you know, proudly the Sabres paraphernalia, everything that we had, hats, you know, scarves, jerseys, everything, okay? And so we're, we're pumped. I mean, this is, this is our year. And as we leave our seats and head into the concourse, a friend of mine who was there with me starts the Let's Go Buffalo chant in the concourse of the Carolina Hurricanes arena. And so proudly we are, let's go Buffalo, right? You know that one, it's a little early, I won't ask you to chime in, but let's go Buffalo. Well, we round the corner in the concourse and we hear someone answer the chant. They say, let's go Buffalo, and then we clapped. And we were suddenly, when we turned the corner, in the midst of maybe 30 or 40 Sabres fans there in Raleigh, North Carolina. And we're ecstatic. We're hugging people. We've never met these people before in our lives. (laughs) We're hugging people. We're high-fiving. We're doing all that stuff. We start, you know, doing the chants and, you know, here we go, Sabres, here we go. And, And we're doing that on the way out to the parking lot. Just just having a blast. One guy's from like Alden and another guy was from Medina and we start to talk and all this funny thing. Anyway, in that moment, in that moment, we were united around one thing. We loved the Sabres and they just won. We were united around that one thing. And you know what? It didn't really matter what the other person in in that group of 40, what any of those other people were Uh, what their background was. It didn't matter uh, what their socioeconomic class was. It didn't matter what race they were or what gender they were. It didn't matter any of those things. Why? Because we were united around something that was uh, bigger than us, and we, we liked that. We were united around one thing, that we loved the Sabres, and they had just won. And it was an incredible feeling that night of belonging, that we belonged to to something great, that we belonged to something bigger than us. And as I tell you that story, again, a true story, as I tell you that, there's nothing strange about that because you know exactly what I'm talking about. 
to be united around a commonality. It's the same thing that happens when you're in a foreign airport, an out of town airport, and you see someone wearing a Buffalo Bills hat. Something wells up within you. It's a commonality. It's the same thing that happens when you're driving down the road and you see a car with the same sticker of the college that you went to. Something wells up, something ignites within you. It's a commonality, something that you can identify with. And so those things are not strange to us. It's not strange to us to find unity where there is a commonality. So what I would then ask today as we turn our attention to the new community, the community called the church, why is it so hard? Why is it so hard to find unity in the body of Christ? If it's so easy for us to find unity in everywhere that we may go, and wherever, whatever situation we might be in, whether it's a, a situation related to geography or where we went to school or a sports team or a club that we're a part of or anything like that, or a cause that we support, anything like that, why is it so easy for us to find unity there? And yet unity, true unity, is so scarce in the body of Christ. Because after all, when we are placed in the new community, when we are placed in Christ through faith, not through any religious observance or, or some sort of ceremonial action, but when we are placed in Christ through faith, he puts us in the new community. We belong to someone greater than us. We belong to something larger than us. We are placed in the new community when we believe by faith. We belong to Jesus. So shouldn't it stand to reason that we have the most commonality with the other people who also belong to Jesus? I mean, just look at even that word, community. Just look at that word, community. You know where it comes from? Common unity. A community is something or a group of someones that has a common unity. Well, for the new community in Christ, that common unity is Jesus, that we belong to him, that we don't belong to ourselves, but we belong to him. So shouldn't we find the best example of unity in the body of Christ? And if that's so, then why is it that experientially or practically or what we can observe, it's so scarce. We all know the stories about churches, local churches that split over the color of the carpet. You know, they, they, one group wants to have maroon, the other group wants to have gold, and, and then they split and they divide and the maroon church starts over here and the gold church starts over here. We all know those stories, right? The, the silly ones. We, we know the ones, uh, I know of a church that moved into a new facility. This was several years ago, moved into a new church facility and there was a kitchen in that new facility. They had not had one prior. And some people in the church wanted to use the kitchen, you know, for like dinners and stuff like that. But that was a big no-no because this was, this was God's house, not a soup kitchen. And they split. Some people left. I know of a church that divided over the timing of the offering. Should it be before the message or after the message? There's another church that divided over whether there should be flowers in the sanctuary on worship days. I, these are silly examples, and we can easily scoff and laugh and, and you know, say, well, that's, you know, that's silly. But yet we accommodate disunity all the time. We accommodate disunity because we allow lesser things to separate us from the supreme things that unite us. We allow little things that maybe you know, have varying degrees of importance, we allow those lesser things to divide us from that which unites us, that we are in Christ. That is the supreme thing that should unite us. And yet we allow racial issues to divide us. We allow socioeconomic status to divide us. We allow political affiliations to divide us. We allow parenting styles to divide us. We allow sides of the tracks to divide us. Yet the supreme thing that should unite us is the very thing that we don't let have the last word. We say these other things 
are more important than that which, what, that which unites us, which is Jesus, that we belong to him. So we desperately need to understand what the scripture says about unity because we accommodate it all the time and we seem to be like, okay, well, that's just a part of life. That's just a part of what it means to, hey, we live in a broken world and that's just our, our lot in life. But these things should not be. And scripture gives us clear instruction about what the nature of the new community should look like. And, and it would begin with a, a negative statement that I wanna share with you. It would begin with this, it's on the screen. God is not glorified in a fractured body. God is not glorified in a fractured body. What do I mean? A fractured church, maybe you could say. God is not glorified in a fractured church. What do I mean? God doesn't get any glory when we allow lesser things to divide us. God doesn't get any glory from that. And the church does not exist for itself. The church exists for God's glory. And he doesn't get any glory when we allow little things to divide us. So we need the scripture to speak into us. We need God to speak to us today. That's why I've asked you to turn to Ephesians 4. At all of our campuses, let me hear you say, if you're there in Ephesians 4, let me hear you say, I'm there. Okay, that was most of us. Ephesians 4, beginning in verse 1. Read with me. Here it is in Ephesians 4. It's on the screen for you. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. This passage, Ephesians 4, 1 to 6, this is going to set the, the trajectory for what I'm going to talk to you about t this morning, what we're going to see from God's word and as it pertains to why we need unity. And I really want to zero in on one thing right in the middle of that passage. I want to zero in on one thing and then kind of build around that to explain why that one thing is necessary. That one thing is in verse 3. Look again, it's on the screen for you. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. I wanna zero in on that one verse and then everything that we say is gonna build around that so we can understand what we are actually supposed to do, what we're supposed to do as a result. This isn't just theoretical, this is practical. So he says, make every effort to do what? He says, to keep the unity of the spirit. To keep the unity. Not manufacture the unity. Not not pursue it even, but to keep the unity. Not to create it, but to keep it. To guard it, to protect it, to preserve it, to nurture it. Keep the unity. Because God has already given us unity. How? In his son. God has made us one. As Spurgeon said, the God who made you one will keep you one. So God has made us that way. And then Paul says here in Ephesians 4, keep the unity, keep it going, propel it forward, guard it from being fractured. He says, keep the unity. So everything that we're going to say this morning will help us to make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit. So there's a few things that the church should be. The church should be, number one, united in worthy living. The church should be united in worthy living. Look again at verse one. As a prisoner of the Lord, for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. I hear, I hear Christians all the time ask, is it a sin if I blank? How far is too far with blank? Is it okay if I blank? And all of those questions, and many like them, are questions about, hey, just tell me where the line is. Just tell me where the line is. Give me the Christian checklist. Don't ask me to think about this, but just give me the Christian checklist. Show me where the line is, and I'm just not gonna go near the line. 
I'll just stay away from the line. That's a question of religion. Give me the do's, give me the don'ts, I got it from here. But that's not what it means to walk as a disciple. Because I hear people ask all the time, hey, what's the right thing to do? What's the wrong thing to do? What's the right thing to do? That's good. I'd, I'd like to probably have more people asking that. But have you ever heard anyone ask this question? What's the worthy thing to do? What's the worthy thing to do? Because worthy gets at the heart, not just the action. Tell me what's wrong, tell me what's right, that says sin management to me. Hey, just give me the checklist and I'll do it. It's behavior modification if you ask me. But to say what's the worthy thing to do gets at the heart of why you do what you do. Because that's, you, you can very quickly identify things in your life that are not worthy of what it means to be a disciple. You may be perfectly allowed to do it. It may be legal in the United States or wherever you live. It may be permissible, but it may not be beneficial. It, is pro it may not be worthy. That's why Paul makes that distinction when he's writing elsewhere. He says, yeah, everything's permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Not everything is worthy of what it means to be a disciple. And instead of us only thinking, just tell me what's right, tell me what's wrong, tell me what's right, tell me what's wrong, God's a bunch of thou shalt and thou shalt nots, we never get to the heart of it. We never get to what is worthy really look like. And I think just maybe as a, as a beginning to understand that, to ask what is the worthy thing to do reveals what you treasure most in your life. What you treasure most in your life. There are far too many Christians, and I'm, I'm lumping me right in that group. Far too many of us live and die and think and act and speak as though the thing we treasure the most is our independence. That's the thing we treasure the most. I'm free to do whatever I want to do. That is a unity killer. That will kill unity. I can do whatever I want. I'll live however I please, thank you very much. That is a unity killer. But to ask what is worthy and maybe to ask what do you treasure, maybe a better thing that we could get at is, well, when we treasure Christ, we will live a life that is worthy of one who follows him. We want to say, all right, God, what's the worthy thing to do? And that will unite us. When we do that together and we can encourage each other on that effort, that will unite us. When we say, I'll do whatever I want, that will kill unity. That will just lop it right off. But to pursue worthy living together, that's what the new community ought to do that we would encourage one another. Uh, Paul said this again in Philippians chapter one. It's a great statement. Look at Philippians 1, 27. He says, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit. Listen, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. It echoes exactly what Ephesians 4 tells us, that we would be united in worthy living. Listen to that phrase, striving together. No lone rangers, striving together as one. But there's a second thing. The church would be united through conflict. Not just united in worthy living, but united through conflict. Look at verse two in our text in Ephesians four. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. These instructions are not necessary if everybody gets along perfectly all the time. Paul doesn't need to say this if everything's peachy in Ephesus where he's writing. But the church should be united through conflict. Now, we have a tendency to glamorize the early church as a utopian movement, free of any problem or conflict or strife or division or potential for division. We have a tendency to do that. Oh, if we could only go back to the days of the early church, 
we say. But that comes from a poor or maybe an incomplete reading of Scripture. Because in Acts 5, there's a disagreement over status. Because the church recognizes someone who gave a large sum, sum of money. And so Ananias and Sapphira, they want that status as well. And so then they get into their whole deal that we covered earlier in this series. In Acts chapter 6, there's a disagreement over the distribution of food to widows, non-Jewish widows and Jewish widows. And there was a, a disagreement over that. In Acts chapter 11, there was a disagreement over eating together with non-Jews. The Jews were, who came to faith in Jesus, the Jewish believers, were disagreed uh, with each other over whether or not they should eat with non-Jewish or Gentile believers. That was in Acts 11. And in Acts 15, there was a disagreement over whether or not circumcision should be a requirement, a prerequisite to receive salvation from Jesus. And that's just kind of skimming the surface. Clearly, you can see there was not an absence of conflict in the early church, that they had their fair share. But what was the difference? Because all of those issues, and many like them, had the potential to create a fractured body. All of those instances that I just mentioned, and many like them, had the potential to create division and fracture the body of Christ, but that did not happen. So what was the difference? What was the difference? Well, the peace of Jesus, P-E-A-C-E, -E, the peace of Jesus ruled and reigned in their lives, in their relationships, in their decision-making, in their conflict resolution. The peace of Christ ruled and reigned. Now, when I say peace, you immediately may think the absence of conflict. Because in our vernacular, if it's peacetime in a country, what's the implication? There's no war. No war equals peacetime. It's either wartime or peacetime. But the early church, many of which were Jewish, and influenced by their understanding of peace, which in the Hebrew is shalom, influenced by their understanding of peace, understood that peace wasn't just the absence of conflict or the absence of disagreement. Peace was, listen, peace was the glue that held them together through conflict. Peace wasn't that there was no disagreement, that there was no conflict, but it was the bond that held them together through conflict, that instead of becoming an unraveled, fractured body, the peace of Jesus had over ruled and overreigned their hearts and their lives to the point that there was nothing that could pull them apart. That even in the midst of conflict, they would be held together because the peace of Jesus ruled and reigned in their lives. They believed this, and Paul would articulate it later uh, in some of his writings. Look at Romans chapter 12, verse 18. It says, if it's possible... As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Sounds an awful lot like Ephesians 4, 3. And then Colossians chapter 3. Listen to these words. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. You see, unresolved conflict or unhealthy conflict is a unity killer. It is a unity killer. Notice, though, that I'm saying unresolved conflict, unhealthy conflict, because when we get into a situation that maybe there's a disagreement with, between us and another disciple, a fellow believer, we feel that friction, right? And we, and we bolt. We run from it. We avoid it. We go to the, we go to the early service because they're going to be at the second service, right? Or vice versa. That, maybe that's not you. I'm sure that's all the people at 11, right? <laughs> they, all, they all left, right, at the second service. Uh, hey, it's, it's not a matter of friction. That's not the problem. 
It's when it becomes fracture. That's the problem. It's not that there can't be friction. In fact, sometimes friction is necessary for the good of the body, that we would purge any sort of wrong from us. So it's not friction that's the problem. It's when we allow friction to break us, to fracture us. That's the problem. That's when it becomes a unity killer. An unresolved conflict, an unhealthy conflict in that way, man, it will destroy and undermine everything we are pursuing with unity. He says, make every effort. Don't just make an effort. Hey, I tried. They wouldn't listen. Make every effort effort. Why? Because we are preaching the gospel every time we resolve conflict with someone in the family of faith. We are preaching the gospel every time we resolve conflict with someone in the body, the new community. Because when the outsiders are looking in to see how these Jesus people deal with conflict, we have an opportunity to either reinforce their sweeping generalizations and stereotypes. See, they can't even agree with one another. We have an opportunity to either reinforce those stereotypes or to give them a clear and accurate picture of what a unified body of believers looks like under the reigner, the king, the the king of peace, Jesus Christ. We have an opportunity to do that when we resolve conflict and to let that be the case. Man, that's... That's something we need to pursue. But there's a third thing that we need to be, that we should be, and that is that we are united within diversity. That we would be, as the church, united within diversity. Look at verse four of Ephesians four. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Just leave that verse up for just one more moment. Because in in these verses, there are seven occasions of the word one. One shows up seven times, but I've called your attention to three specifically. There is one spirit, there is one Lord, and there is one God and Father. Those three are especially important for us. Thank you. Why do I draw your attention to that? Not only because this passage is all about unity, seven times we see one, but because we see right in the midst of this passage a description of the nature of God, that God himself is a unity within diversity. There is one spirit, there is one Lord, which Uh, Over a hundred times in the New Testament is a reference to Jesus when you see that word Lord. Most of the time it's a reference to him. And one God and Father. Meaning, God is three and yet one. There are three persons, yet there is one God. God is a unity within diversity. God the Father is not at war with God the Son And they're not at war with God the Spirit. They are unified forever, eternally, as one. And yet they are distinct. God the Father is not the same as God the Son, is not the same as God the Spirit. These things, I mean, these are heavy things. I'm not trying to overload you, but it's necessary for what we need to describe this morning. Because God is a unity within diversity. And the church, listen, the church should reflect the nature of God. The church should be a reflection of the nature and character of God. You see, when theologians were trying to describe this very unique piece of doctrine, they came up with this word, trinity, which just means try unity. Not, hey, you should try unity today, but try unity, T-R-I, three in one. They were describing it that way. Well, the new community should be a reflection of the Trinity. And that means we must be united within diversity. It's not enough 
just for us to say, yeah, we're diverse. The body of Christ is diverse. Yeah, over there, there's, there's the black church. There's the white church. There's the Hispanic church. There's the Asian church. That's not enough. We must be united within diversity. That these things would never unravel us or pull us apart, but that we would be united within them. Because as I've said, we allow lesser things to separate us and divide us from the supreme things that unite us. Lesser things like issues of socioeconomic status. You think rich people are all snotty. Or you think poor people are all dirty. You think, listen, you think black people are too loud. Or you think white people are too boring. You think Democrats are socialists. Or you think Republicans are greedy. Or people from this neighborhood are low lives. Or people from that neighborhood are uppity. And we are so content to live in that spot and accommodate it. I am and you are. We are so, yeah, that's just the way it is with those kinds of statements. And they do not belong in the new community. These are things that we should find outside of the new community. These are things we should not be surprised to find outside of the body of believers who have been regenerated and transformed by Jesus Christ. We shouldn't be surprised to hear those stereotypes as punchlines on The Tonight Show, but they should not have any footholds in the new community known as the church. They do not belong. This is a, this is a body of believers that reflects our God, who is a unity within diversity. So listen, how does that work itself out? I'm not advocating for uniformity. I'm not saying, so let's just put all of that aside. Let's be colorblind. Let's just ignore which side of the tracks we come from. No, that does a disservice to the beautiful mosaic that God has been putting together in the church. That does a disservice to it because he is calling people from every tribe and every nation and every tongue and every economic status to himself so that he can say, look what I've done. Nobody else can do that but God. So don't confuse unity with uniformity because, listen, anybody, anybody can get along with someone that they agree with. Anybody can do that. Anybody can get along with, maybe a, a better statement would be, anybody can get along with someone who agrees with them. Oh, they agree with me. I like that person. Anybody can do that. So what distinguishes the body of Christ? What distinguishes the new community from everything else that we can find? People who don't agree about every single thing are united in Christ. We agree on the supreme things. And when the world sees that, they see something they can't find anywhere else. There's a fourth thing. The church should be united around the gospel. The church should be united around the gospel. There is only one gospel. Look at verses five and six. Here's a description of the gospel. There's one Lord, there's one faith, there's one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. That's the gospel. We need to be united around that. But we make one of two primary errors with the gospel. We make it more exclusive than God made it, or we make it more inclusive than God made it. Here's what it sounds like when you make the gospel more exclusive than God did. You get your life together, and then you can come to Jesus. You get cleaned up, you get rid of that drug habit, 
stop cheating over here and you do all those things and, and then we can talk. You get your life together, then you can be in our community. We make the gospel more exclusive than God made it. Or to be, to be popular, to soften the message so that it's palpable to people, to lessen the reaction, the, divi the dividing line that Christ is, we make the gospel more inclusive than God made it. Hey, don't worry about it. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to change anything. Jesus will take care of it. He's your buddy. And by the way, all roads lead to Rome. Hey, Jesus is just one of many options out there for you. But hey, don't worry. He's your homeboy. He's not going to ask you to do anything uncomfortable. He's not going to ask you to give anything up. He's not going to ask you to sacrifice anything. Because, you know, after all, we're just all on a journey to God. And however we get there, we get there. That is to make the gospel more inclusive than God made it. And I'm being kind in both of those scenarios because the truth is, those are both false gospels. Those are not good news. Neither of those is good news. Neither of them. But what we must do is pursue unity around the gospel, the one gospel. If we can't be united here, we have nothing to offer the world. If we can't have gospel unity, we have nothing to give. Paul, Paul treats this issue very seriously when he writes, so much so that he uses strong words for anybody who preaches a different gospel. Look what he says in Galatians 1, verse 8. He says, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. And then writing to the church at Corinth, he says, and you guys, you guys let anything happen. Look what he says. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the spirit you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. As if to say, why do you do that? Why do you allow that to happen? Because to espouse a different gospel is to fracture the body. If you receive another gospel that's more palpable, that's more suitable for a Facebook post, that's going to get a lot of likes, that's going to get you uh, to you know, find favor at the office, or that you won't be excluded from a conversation or excluded from an invitation to a party because, hey, hey, we're all just on this journey together. Hey, it doesn't matter what you do. Jesus will work it out. Or if you're the person over here who says, here, you got to jump through these hoops and then we'll see how serious you are to get to God. In both cases, that is a dividing line in the church. That kills unity. We must be united around the gospel. We must be. But listen, this is going somewhere. Unity is crucial, but we're going somewhere. As I said already, God is not glorified in a fractured church or a fractured body. But let me, let me add to that. How is God glorified? Look at the screen. It says this. God is not glorified in a fractured body. Rather, God is glorified when his church is unified. God is glorified when his church is unified. If you're in Ephesians chapter 4, you're just looking at it. Look at the last verse of chapter 3, Ephesians 3.21. It says, to him, that is God, be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations. To him be glory in the church. The church is where God's glory is best seen. It is best on display. Why is that? Because he makes us one. And only God could do what he's done in the new community. Only God could bring all of us together at all of our campuses as one. Not just as one in the sense of we are the chapel, but as one, members of his worldwide body, the capital C church, that we could be one. Only God could do that. 
Only God could do that. Because people on opposite sides of the party line refused to come and meet in the middle. People on, on all different sides of the tracks won't cross those tracks. People from rich neighborhoods and poor neighborhoods don't get together. But in the new community, God has made us one. And the God who has made us one will keep us one. And why does he keep us one? Because it doesn't end at unity. Listen, it doesn't end with unity. God wants his church to be unified for a purpose, and it's on the screen. God wants his church to be unified for the sake of the mission. God wants his church to be unified for the sake of the mission. Because if there is one Lord, if there is one faith, if there is one baptism, if there is one spirit, and there is one body, and there is one God and Father of all, if there is only one, that message has to be shared. That message has to be proclaimed. That message has to be lived. It cannot be contained in the walls of a church facility or a church gathering. It cannot stay here because we weren't unified just so that we could take care of each other and pat each other on the back and give ourselves a pep talk and go back and not make any difference, not make any dent in the darkness of our geography. God unified his church so that we would be on mission with him because people absolutely need this message. And this is not, listen, this is not intolerant. This is not intolerant because the gospel is inclusive. Whosoever will may come. That's old timer language for if you want Jesus, he's yours. No one will be turned away, ever, ever. What other offer in the world is like that? Every commercial we hear, some restrictions may apply. <laughs> Not the gospel. That's why we say the gospel is the best news. The gospel is inclusive. Whosoever will may come. But the gospel is exclusive because, listen, there is no other name, no other name under heaven by which people can be saved, forgiven, set free, transformed, redeemed, placed in Christ. No other name. And that is not an intolerant message. Any more than, as John Piper has said, that's not an intolerant message, any more than a doctor would be intolerant of poison and tolerant of medicine. I'm intolerant of the poison that seeks to destroy the people that I love and that you love, that says, you're okay, I'm okay. So if I'm intolerant, I'm intolerant of that. But the gospel has made it clear. No one who comes to Jesus will be turned away, but there is only one way, and it is Jesus. So why should you and I care about unity? With this, I'm done. Why should you and I care about unity? Because Jesus, the head of the body, the Lord of the new community, he cares about unity. If for no other reason, it's because our Lord cares about it. He cares about it and he prayed about it. Look at John 17, verses 20 to 23. My prayer is not for them alone. He's speaking of his faithful disciples there. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you loved me. Jesus cares about unity. Jesus prayed for unity. Jesus died for this unity. He rose again for this unity. He lives forevermore for this unity. Therefore, church, make every effort, every 
effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. With me, bow your heads and close your eyes. We'll be gone from just a minute. Before I hand it over to our campus pastors in Lockport and Chictawaga, let me just ask you this. Let me ask you this, all of us. What are you doing right now? Just ask yourself this with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. God, God hears your heart. Ask God for help on this. But ask yourself, what are you doing right now to keep the unity of the Spirit? And what are you doing right now? What are you believing right now? How have you been living right now that could actually undermine or perhaps even kill the unity? Maybe through unworthy living, I'll live however I want. Maybe through allowing a conflict to come between you and a fellow believer. You don't know what they've done to me. Maybe through a lack of unity around diversity. I don't associate with those people. Or maybe through a misunderstanding of the gospel. I would encourage you in your hearts right now to repent of those things as we together preserve, keep, are diligent to guard the unity of the Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you hear us when we pray that you know our hearts, you know our shortcomings, you know our strengths and our weaknesses, you know the things that we wish weren't the case about ourselves, and you know, more importantly, what you've called us to be, to be a unified church. Beyond the walls of the chapel, beyond the region of Western New York, beyond the American church, but your body, your one church to which we belong, something greater and bigger than us. God, thank you for that sense of belonging and may it drive us to be people who keep your unity in place. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, our Savior, amen. Thanks, everyone. We love you. You're dismissed. Have a great Sunday.